Right, what we're going to do today is the first part of it. We're going to go run over a little bit about, for some of you, real, real 101. But we're going to go over what we did when we looked at how we created brands from scratch. So my background is I ran a design agency for 22 years uh, and sold that last February. What we're going to do is we're going to take you through so a few little case studies on the way. So we're going to touch on Apple, some horses, uh, Coca-Cola, Alfa Romeo, and then giving up smoking as some examples about, about how branding works and why it works. And then we're going to go on to sort of like more of the meat, as has uh, been beautifully described of the world as well. So, five key points today. Secret art of branding. Why perception is more important than reality. How we branded for Worldwood, what, you know, what we claim as a world-class attraction. Um, how value should anchor every single decision uh, and some predictions of the future, all of which Mark stole from us in his presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Oh, and just to say, by the way, Wolverhampton Polly is in the top three. So <laughs> that's to add to your file. So you look at that, everyone immediately knows what that is. Apple. There's always been accusations that that's a logo, but now all of us here with this experience know that's a brand. What that means for all of us is that when we arrive, we see a logo, we see that brand, we expect that we're going to be treated in a certain way going forward. That's become the perception about how brands work in the last sort of 20 or so years. In the old days, it was obviously corporate identity. So that's what everyone expects now. But what's happened, and what we think we really got into, was seeing where every single touch point could be affected by the brand. It was literally turning things upside down and seeing what could we do with it that actually made, how could we make that branded. And one thing to really back up, what each of the speakers before us said, I think Allegheny in particular, is that quality is everything. Uh, in that you, the more you advertise a bad product, the faster it will fail. This is a beautiful example for me, because Simon's an Alfa Romeo driver. I've got uh, a 10-year-old Alfa Romeo. Thank you, John. And <laughs> Alfa Romeo had a little problem in the 70s where they didn't concentrate on their quality. Uh, they made cars that weren't zinc-coated, basically. The panels weren't zinc-coated. And 30, 40 years later, most of us in the room... I think would still say, would be nervous about buying Fiat's or Alfa Romeo's because of the perception of rust. So therefore, it doesn't really matter in a way. It doesn't matter. The quality's got to be right, but then the perception you create from it is incredibly important. You have to really, really focus on that. This is backed up in a really incredibly dry book by Jean-Claude Lourèche called The Momentum Effect. Uh, and he's put on there, his whole summary of this enormous book is that throwing good, money, uh, throwing good money at a bad product is a complete waste of effort. You're much, much better to actually invest in the quality of the product and allow your customers to come and experience it and absolutely love it and then just keep reinvesting uh, in, in better and better product. Don't just keep advertising bad stuff, otherwise you're constantly creating churn and trying to drive new traffic. Click. So brands are perceptions, all about perceptions, and they're completely personal. They are absolutely and utterly your own. I don't know anyone else's perceptions in here. These are some of mine, ours. Um, Body Shop used to be a beautiful company. Used to love them. Anita Roddick sold it to L'Oreal, and then all of a sudden they didn't seem to care as much. You couldn't actually bring back your bottles and get them refilled in the store. Almost the first thing that L'Oreal did was they took that away. Now, are there any Audi drivers in the room? And how many of you are vegetarians? <coughs> One. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you bought the wrong brand by mistake. <laughs> uh, and again, perception. Waitrose couldn't sell a burger uh, with horse in it, but Tesco are going to do it again, guarantee it. Because the reason is, Waitrose brand value is trust. They've become almost like curators of good food for us. So therefore, they concentrate so much on creating trust, they won't do it. They actually don't accidentally go like that and nudge horses in when they're walking past the vats of meat. <laughs> Ryanair, I think, are now so hateful. They've actually worked it out, haven't they? They're actually going the other way. They're so hateful, they became a parody brand, and the only way they're starting to fight back now is pretending they care a little bit. You can bring tin bags on them. Um, and this is when it gets very personal. I have put this one in for Simon. Uh, Norwich, you're about to get relegated. Thank Will you. one day win the Premiership. <laughs> and Oxford United, who were the first team to be banned from Europe after winning the Milk Cup in 1986, will again triumph in Europe. Move on, John. <laughs> so who knows what this is? No, it's not actually. It's just a horse. <laughs> it's a general horse. And what are these? I know there's ponies on there as well. I've been told before. There's been... How do we know they're all horses? <laughs> it's a common theme, the horse thing. How do we know they're all horses? 
Not one of them has got a logo on it. So how do we know they're horses? <laughs> yeah. There's loads of different reasons. There's loads and loads and loads of little things that add up to making them have a certain degree of horsiness about them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the secret of brands, really. It's about creating degrees of horsiness. So this was first established in 1915. Terra Hoyter Glass Company was set this brief by Coca-Cola. Smash, create a bottle that you can smash into 100 pieces and then put it back together. Any single piece could be picked up and be clearly identifiable as the Coke brand. And this is what we set out to do. We wanted to create a breakable brand where you could pick any part of Bewilderwood up and know that it was a Bewilderwood branded experience. So whilst we play around, we have fun, the whole thing was all done with that strategy right from the outset. So the one note to write down, it's the only bit that I actually can ever teach anyone really, is the secret about branding isn't about brands, it's about creating differences. And then delivering them everywhere, consistency consistently, is the thing we talk about all the time. Actually creating consistent differences. Actually looking what everyone else is doing and then doing the opposite. If everyone else is zigging, then use that. So who in the room smokes? There must be some, few at the back, good, in the north corners. Um, now if you're going to choose one word to think about giving up smoking using Nicorette, what would you choose? What do you think their brand word is, their single word? Pardon? Craving. Craving. Okay. Any others? Come on. <laughs> Quit. Quit. Stop. Yeah. stop. That's the whole thing. Is their entire brand is not based on the word stop or quit or take anything away. It's based on the word start. So because of that, everything they write is more positive. All of their imagery is more positive. It's about starting a new life. It's about creating life beyond smoking. It's about building a better future for yourself and for your family and all of these things. So they changed their entire brand perception with one word. If that had been stop, it would have been negative, it would have been taking away, it would have been losing something that you actually craved and all of those things. <coughs> so because of that, they've actually managed to create a positive experience out of what for me was a horrific, horrible experience of giving up smoking. <coughs> so now we bring Mr. Egan in. Um, this is what we started with. We did, and a brief to create an attraction uh, with to Tom and I, Tom who owns this Pongy Marsh. Uh, and challenge number one was it was impenetrable. Challenge number two, Tom or I had never done anything like this before. Challenge number three, uh, it was in Norfolk. And we didn't hear the people who said, don't build a, a new attraction in Norfolk at the time. We just didn't hear them. We had to build it there because that's where Tom's estate is. Um, so we had quite a lot of challenges. And on the way, big story getting there, but meeting John, who we thought we were just going to go and get a logo from, because we were a new company. And he, sa he says that we talked about creating 100 pieces like the Coke bottle. That's what he did. He was driving us to this point, and I only saw his presentation a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I, it just made sense. That's exactly what John made us do. He made us break the business down, every single element of it, even the, the email signatures. We've got our designer sitting in the middle of the room there. He's very tall. Um, and he creates graphics. So his name, his office name, is Lanky Doodle at Bewilderwood. <laughs> so every element, even everyone's signature, email signatures, right through to everything in the, in, the, in the wood that we'll show you, is considered in a kind of fun, Bewilderwood, whatever that might mean, way. And there should be. If you haven't been to Bewilderwood or Norfolk... Hurrah! Oh. It's only 90 seconds.
other music was better, wasn't it? <laughs> um, you could talk about our real values, John. Okay. We started off with uh, a one-page document, uh, which was really just summarising everything we thought we had. At the time, it was going to be called the Rocks and Treehouse Adventure, wasn't it? Uh, and then we, we didn't got, know what to call it. Yeah, and we, it was a working title of that, or Kingswater, wasn't it? And we worked with... So we sat down and we created these three values, fun, imagination, adventure, and thought, how can we push those through everything? <coughs> fun, because obviously, if you want to go to a place like that, it's got to be fun. Imagination was quite a big one, because one of the really critical things from the outset was that making sure that you had to use your imagination. You could go there and you could have fun, but if you, did, if you used your imagination, it actually became even better. Uh, and the, we do get some complaints, and the few complaints we ever get are where people have arrived and they're expecting a completely passive come and entertain me experience and then they... Yeah, because most attractions you go to and if, you, if you, 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 you get on a ride and it takes you and something happens by not doing very much, but in Bewildered, if you stand still, if you just get there and stand still, nothing happens. You've got to interact. So, uh, you know, you've got to want to go on an adventure and, and, and we'll get on to this sort of family element. So, uh, Im imagination. And, then and the adventure, is, it's got to be adventurous right the way through, but it's ultimately got to be incredibly safe, but it's... Uh, We've used those values to guide pretty much every decision. So, because it wasn't anything, and we created it from, from, from nothing, at, at every point in its development, going, working up the designs and putting it all together for a planning application and then achieving planning and starting to build it, at every point we could have said, and I remember a number of occasions when I thought we'd done it, you know, we'd got what we were going to build, and we got to a point like this where the... You know, and some rather rude American bloke that Ros Johnson introduced us to, John Vavuka, who's obviously very good, he, uh, he, 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 he specialised in interpretation. He came along and he looked at all our lovely design, designs and said they're fantastic. And I think Nick reminded me, they, they're just like, what are the sheds in trees? Which I thought they were quite funky tree houses, but they are just sheds in trees. And in about two or three years' time, he said that they'll be very tired and you as an attraction will be struggling to keep moving forward. So, and we were advised to go and look for some, uh, for some pixie dust or something just to, to add another layer. We had no idea of a story. We had no idea of characters. Um, we just had lots of funky designs of sheds and trees. Uh, and it took about a year, but we then got to that point with the help of a few people in this room, um, which just started giving it a little bit of a layer of something different. Um, so having then got the, the, some rather magical designs and colourful things, and we then had to work out how we deliver it. So getting onto the content, how do you deliver that into this pongy marsh, this woodland, um, in a way that <coughs> requires you to imagine it still, rather than just possibly meeting the characters? Or and it, it, so so when you see the places that these characters that you never meet might be, they're always far up in the trees or over in the marsh. You can't touch them; you can just see them. Which when you have the boat ride in, you saw on the video. Swampy lives in the marsh over there somewhere, and the boat ride driver will say, you know, he's not in, but you can't see him, but he is in, because you can see his washing hanging out on the, on the line, or the light might, might be on. And, so, and the kid's just completely immersed in it. And it's a rather cheapskate way of doing it. It doesn't cost any money. It's just tell the story. But it's, you know, if you're a child who still believes in Father Christmas, you believe in the twiggles and boggles of the wildwood. And some people do want to. Um, other people don't, and they just have a fantastic, fun day. So it doesn't need to be all of those things. So, more of the story that we put in. This was actually when we worked out we had something quite special, really, because we this got, on the launch weekend, uh, May 2007, this got photographed and put in The Guardian. Uh, and one of the things they wrote was that if people cared this much about the signage, then what else did they... Oh, sorry, Nick. What else did they, uh, what else did they taken care of? Um, and this is probably still one of our most photographed things in the park, even though it's such a small thing. Um, and we've, we're still completely non-smoking throughout the park, so uh, and we get almost no incidents of it. One of the other elements that we did from the outset was an idea about not having any competing brands. On all of our original imagery, we took off every single brand, off any clothing, off any image. Um, and that was being a brand snob, really, partly. But there was a reason for it as well. We wanted ours to actually be able to flourish, so we wanted to give it a complete carte blanche to be able to flourish on its own. Uh, and we, we did it almost by instinct, I think, as well, in, in the shop, that we didn't want to sell anyone else's brands in the shop, so we just we never did. Uh, and then there's been some great research by uh, Sheena Ioniga, who's a professor at Columbia. And 
we've always had quite a successful shop, even though it's always been too small, it's always been too busy, and it's never really had enough product in it. And part of that, that research showed then that it was done with jams, uh, jam tasting. And when people walked along and they had 24 different jams to taste, 60% of them tasted it, but only 3% of them bought it. When there was only six jams to choose from, only 40% of them tasted it, but, no, hang on, only four, yeah, only 40% of them tasted it, but only 30% uh, of them then went on to buy it. So it was actually six times more, ultimately. It came but we, we didn't instinctively read that and do it, because that was written in 2010, we opened in 2007. Yeah, we did it before, yeah. And our problem was that we were in the middle of a wood, we were expecting 60,000 people in a whole year, in the first year or two, and we had 12,000 people in our second week. So we were completely overwhelmed. So how do you deliver food to 3,000 people in one place in a wood uh, and, and for them to go away happy? And so we, we did, what we did, we chose to really pare down what, what our offer was. So we wouldn't do a burger that wouldn't keep, it would dry out. We, and we, so we got a very basic menu. And then, of course, along comes John and uh, you know, that makes it an official approach. Mm. <laughs> uh, next slide. So, uh, yeah, so it, it shops one thing, but um, this is quite an interesting story. This is, when you take the boat round, you come into what we call the Scary Lake, where you might meet Mildred, but, um, who's a vegetarian, Audi owner, crocker yeah. <laughs> um, Anyway, so the, when we were building Bewilderwood, about halfway, it took a year to, to, to turn this wood into this place. And the Walls Ice Cream Salesman, because no, no one had, within our team had ever built an attraction before, we were, just, we were just making it up every day, and the Walls Ice Cream Man was waiting for us to be ready to open. And the rep, first of all, he's quite, I thought he was quite a nice bloke, but the, sort of the fifth or sixth time he came round to our compound saying, when you open, you must be having Walls Ice Creams. And something within us was saying, we don't want Walls Ice Creams. And in the end, he started getting really annoying because he kept coming around the back in his car and saying, you know, you'll sell £70,000 worth of Walls Ice Creams. And in the end, I said, that'll be great. I'm sure we'll sell £70,000 worth of ice creams. We just need to go and build it. Could you go away, please? We, we want to have some lovely Norfolk local ice cream. We forgot to order the lovely Norfolk ice cream, <laughs> but that's what we wanted to do. So, but we did open, like, like we ended up opening with a book and we didn't know we were going to have one. We did open with a lovely Norfolk ice cream and we sold £90,000 worth of it. So, you know, detail, detail, detail. And there were, three, there were three reasons, or three reasons for that sale. One, it was local, it was actually nicer, so people bought more of it. Secondly, we actually made a bigger profit from it as well because it was from Paragani's who are lovely little, they only had five ice cream vans and they initially said, we can't give you everything you need. We said, okay, we'll have everything you can give us then instead. Uh, but we were their biggest customer by a country mile, so we got a much better margin from them than we and did. And a service. And a great service from them as well. And because it was a lovely non-known brand, it didn't put a competitive walls flags all over our park. So the reason that picture, the walls ice cream man, when he, he got annoyed with us as well because we kept telling him to go away. He finally said, look, to seal the deal, you can have as many Walls ice cream umbrellas as you want. <laughs> so imagine that scene if it, was, it had lovely Walls ice cream umbrellas on it. And that's the kind of difference that we're talking about or trying to talk about. Uh, benign adventure. It's, it's just it's part of the elements that make up. So nothing ever bad happens in Bewildered. It's all perfectly safe whilst kids are having an adventure. But we'll scoot over that. Th this is rather key. Families playing together. So... We're build, building something for down at the Cotswold Wildlife Park, and it is a fantastic attraction, the Cotswold Wildlife Park. And they've got a really good playground, which is visited by 300,000 people a year. And having gone back to it the other day, watching families playing in it, and it's really brought home what we do, and or well, you must remember what we do, is that uh, all the mothers and the fathers, there must be two or 300 of them sort of standing in a row. There's not even anywhere for them to sit, just standing with their arms folded. Well, the kids are going up and down this slide and round and back. But in Bewildered, it's absolutely the opposite of that. A lot of families come in feeling a bit nervous they've got to play with their children, but within about 20 minutes or half an hour, they're just doing it. They're going down all the slides, and it's, it is a big difference. That we, uh, oh, this is a One of the things, that, again, we did, there was a mistake made at the start of today's presentations where you told everyone to turn their phones off. We did exactly the opposite. We told them to turn it on, and what we do now is we encourage our staff team members, when they see an opportunity like that, to actually go out and say, would you like us to take a picture uh, of you? And that's because it's not just about being a nice, normal family these days. It's about being seen to be a nice, normal family on Facebook. So, what we, <laughs> so we, get people to, we get people to take photos. So to prove we're born so no, what are we going to do now? We are. Come on. Oh, come on we're going to do a selfie. And then we're going to put out on the Blue Loop Live hashtag. So. There we are. Right, we'll put that out on the hashtag. <laughs> 
Uh, and because of that, all, of the, all the people who get their picture taken share their pictures at Bewilderwood with all of their like-minded friends. And we're putting on 1,000, we're not quite at the 2,000 a week for what the extreme are doing, but we're putting on 1,000 a month, which for a little attraction in, in Norfolk is growing pretty fast. We put 2,500 as we opened in February this year, so it's growing quite well. And it's where the vast majority of our traffic is coming from now. So. Uh, right, so coming to the end of the world, because John's got more to talk about other things, but we, this might be our next opportunity to... That, 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 was, that, that, that was our swamp at the beginning of Norfolk, and we, this is an opportunity that may come about. We've finally got planning after about three years of quite hard work, building the whole concept and working quite closely with the National Trust, which is quite interesting, because talking about brand alignment, we might come back to that. But this is our next swamp where we might try and make something else up. We'll start from where we're at, which is a different place to when we started. Um, and we might just do that. OK, we've got two other examples just in the, in the wider world that we've worked on as well. This is Go Ape. Go Ape used to be very much, Go Ape, you did Go Ape. You'd done Go Ape, you'd done your adventure. And the big change we did with Tris, who owned it, was we said, really, it should become part of your adventure diet. So uh, they, they thought they were the be-all and end-all of adventure. But once people had done it, they stopped doing it. So there was never a, you never went and did the others as well. They never created a chain of events through them. So we did lots of messing around with that. But the big thing was trying to make it so that an, an accountant dad could look cool to his son. Uh, so we made it so that it was very appealing to them. And then the merchandise we created allowed them to reinforce the fact they were actually quite cool. So that when they got home, they had that mug there reminding them, look, son, I'm actually quite cool. I might be an accountant, but I'm quite cool. <laughs> um, and so the whole thing was based around that sort of being part of your adventure diet and then living life adventurously. So... And this is one that Ros Johnson and a very clever team did as well, uh, which was the three words, changing the whole brand to three words, which I had to write down, and I've lost them. Courageous, authentic, and personal. I think Portsmouth Historic Dockyard had been very much in the doldrums until this work sort of kicked off everything. And those three words allowed them to start making quite courageous decisions and start personalising the experience. And then, not just because of that, again because of the work that they did and because of the work that they've done with Forex as well, uh, they pretty much doubled their visitor numbers in the last couple of years to so just over 700,000. So our summary slide, all of these have been stolen by Mark. <laughs> very much indeed. Brand alignments are something we're seeing more. The, the way for us a brand alignment would work, and we haven't really done any yet at all with Bewilder, but it's one we've thought about, is that if we have the same values and a slightly different audience, then there's a, there's a possible brand alignment, or if we have the same audience and slightly different values, then we can actually extend each other's audiences. That's when they actually start to really make sense. Multi-multimedia, uh, again, designing rides and games from the outset, is actually thinking about every element of the audience and every different possible touch point right from the outset is something that's happening all over the place. One of our big secrets was merchandising the story, um, again, which is when we create characters, we think about sort of five different things that define those characters, and we've been really quite sneaky and defined those those defining points as things we can merchandise. But we've been quite, quite privileged because our characters didn't exist before, yeah. so we have made them up with, with these thought processes now. And they're still very old-fashioned, you know, Winnie the Pooh characters, but in a slightly more modern world. You go somewhere. Oh, this is your <laughs> bit. Okay, yours, man. Hey, you want me to change the slide? Uh. <laughs> no, we'll carry on for a bit. <laughs> if you own the clicker, you own the, you own the presentation. <laughs> You, oh, it, it is my go. It is it? your go, yeah. All oh, right, okay. Uh, if you, well, I don't own the brand, so I don't have the profit. Um, consistency, consistently. Well, that's through actually what everybody's been saying today. Uh, you know, just do whatever it is you do, you just do it everywhere. And I go back to those 100 pieces of the Coke bottle, which, you know, it, in these conferences, I always take one or two things away. And that is one of the things I would take away. Uh, uh, and content. Co so we quickly tried to show you what all the different layers that Bewilder's made up of. Because something, something makes it, like these guys are not punching above the weight, they're, just, they're big guys, whereas we're, tiny, we're a small attraction in Norfolk. And why, why has it been talked about? Why are we being asked to talk about it? And it's the content, it's the detail, which is everything in whatever you do, I think. Uh, and that's John saying, keep it real. I don't know what that means. You put that on there. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> I think just do everything instinctively. The end. Yeah. <laughs> but look, 12 o'clock. Right? <laughs> yeah.